and uh, it's nice of uh, everyone to be here because I know this is this time of the year that it's the end of the year and finals and all of that and a lot of people are traveling to the heart rhythm so those who are here it's nice to have you here. So we are basically continuing our uh, Dutch festival. <laughs> We started our Dutch festival at the beginning of last week with the group from Amsterdam. And they uh, left Saturday, and now we're having a group from uh, Maastricht. And uh, they're very distinguished as such. We have three guests who are here, uh, who are sitting in the audience, but they're participants in everything that's going on here. And of course, Dr. Walters, and Dr. Walters is uh, an MD PhD. That is to say, he is a cardiologist and he's a researcher. And um, he's done uh, beautiful work on the molecular basis of genetic rhythm disorders in the heart. And uh, being a clinician, he also does uh, clinical work on hereditary arrhythmias. Uh, of different types, so in this room here we see, and I can go and, and cite some more. But we've been friends for some time, and I spent some time in Maastricht, which is by the, by the way a beautiful city in the southern of, south of uh, the Netherlands, bordering with Belgium and Germany. And I recommend a visit to all of you, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Rob. Uh, is it okay if I speak without the microphone, or is it not clearly well? Okay. I wish to wish you all the thanks, you all, and, and your whole team. I, I think I met most of you uh, today. We met most of you today, so that is very much appreciated. It's, it's, um, is it not? Yeah. Is it not clear enough? Yeah. Give me a little more space. The microphone will help, I think. Sir? Reciprocating, uh, reciprocating the thanks, your friendship is the best word, um, and we strongly feel it on many visits uh, that we have together, and also in the way that we uh, continue to uh, express uh, interest in each other's work. That's also very much appreciated, and as we have seen in the uh, discussions of today, it's um, really with a lot of common interest. So thank you for having us. Thank you for sharing the data, all of you. Um, and um, let's uh, see if we can work together for a couple of more years, uh, uh, as we can see it now. Thank you. Um, I'd spend the, I will spend the next hour in discussing with you some aspects as we have come to learn them in the Lower PT syndrome type 1. Um, but I will start off by continuing a little bit on the Dutch festival because um, the information I can also give you that in Holland at this moment we have Liberation Day. What is Liberation Day? Liberation Day is the uh, moment that we were liberated from the Nazis. May 5, 1945. Um, so this is a picture, um, and it's uh, from Amsterdam, um, and many Americans, many Canadians, and the Polish soldiers came there to liberate us, and we are still thankful for that, and it's a big event, so there's a national holiday where people celebrate um, that, that fact, and uh, also the fact that we got back our freedom, and I thought I'd show it to you because of all the actual global developments, uh, not at the least uh, in the Ukraine. Okay, 
This is the most important slide. This is uh, our team back in Maastricht. And we are at the uh, Maastricht University Medical Center. And within that center, there is a lot of uh, focus on cardiovascular disease as well as other diseases. But cardiovascular has been strong for a number of decades already uh, at our relatively young university. So Maastricht is uh, by far much younger than St. Louis uh, Washington University. Um, here the uh, Cardiovascular Research Institute, was, uh, which is what CARAM stands for. It is uh, established in the end of the 80s, 1988, and is now existing uh, more than 25 years. And it's brought a lot of good to the research in Maastricht. Why? Because various disciplines uh, related to cardiovascular disease were um, brought together um, and to learn from each other and to bring in data that make better research rather than to focus with the own discipline alone. So these are the people in, uh, in my team. On the right side there, uh, photo, and you recognize Christina Moreno, uh, who is in the audience, and Rachel Tabeke, and the rest of the people uh, who are not here. They will come at some other time, I hope. We are funding uh, by the Netherlands Heart Foundation, as well as what is written at the left bottom part, uh, the Netherlands uh, Organization for Scientific Research. What is the problem? What are we investigating? Well, uh, in cardiology, we are often faced with serious arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias. <clears throat> and this is an old picture from 1972 of my uh, former mentor, Hein Wellens, well known in the field, who was investigating the uh, episodes of collapse in a young lady, a patient from the Amsterdam region. <coughs> who uh, was brought to the lab, she was put to sleep, and then suddenly at night an alarm was uh, rung. And you can see what happened. Uh, they could um, uh, produce the arrhythmia that caused her to uh, collapse. And fortunately, this was spontaneously terminating. They didn't have to defibrillate. And interestingly, when um, they did this again, but now under propranolol, beta blocker, uh, no such event occurred anymore. It's not the full story, it's uh, apart from propranolol, they added uh, diphenyl hedantoin, a, a drug that we will not use currently in the clinic anymore, at least not in cardiology, but it has some sodium blocking effects. So interestingly, um, this was 1972. We didn't have any diagnosis on lung QT syndrome at that time. Well, it was recognized that it could be prolonged, but it was not recognized that there was a syndrome as such. For sure we didn't know that this was a lung QT2 patient, which is nowadays uh, what she's diagnosed with, because she's still alive. Um, and for sure we didn't know much about um, sympathetics and the heart and the way we should understand the influence of the autonomic nervous system to the changes in the heart rate that evoke such VT. Uh, what is interesting, if you look over the decades that came afterwards, is that we have come a long way to learn about the molecular underpinning, the genetic underpinning of QT prolongation with all the genes that are currently known to produce lung QT syndrome as the list is still growing. We have more than 16 genes by now that may produce lung QT syndrome. Um, so that uh, obviously is an achievement over the last 20 years and it's still ongoing. We have learned something on the red box here, what is happening in the moments that you have not just the long QT but the initiation of the VT. And those moments, they are obviously characterized by uh, dramatic changes in the uh, heart rate, uh, extrasystolic activity, variable degrees of uh, depolarization, uh, dispersion, um, and many other aspects. And um, although there has been considerable research in this field of increased sympathetic activity and what it does to the heart, I think it's fair to say that um, by far this is not enough. We do not understand very well what is happening between stable depolarization uh, and the moment that VT initiates. 
and how the autonomic nervous system is influencing this. So this is a little bit of, uh, of, of an introduction to the topic. Doug Zipes put it correctly in his 1991 editorial when he called this syndrome a Rosetta stone for sympathetic related ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And I think it's correct and it still is because of all the information that uh, it gives, uh, not just for the understanding of the rare syndrome, which is what the long QT syndrome is, but rather as a help, help and guide for the understanding of many more conditions in which empathetics turn uh, the heart to arrhythmia. We have also come to understand the levels of complexity that underlie the initiation of arrhythmia in these hearts. Um, because we understood the uh, complex integrated neurocardiac interface that affects the occurrence of uh, uh, the arrhythmia, the myocardial aspects, um, the myocyte, the ion channel, and the genotype. And all these levels, uh, they interact. There are many aspects of, of uh, many complexities that we still have to uh, understand better and also how to integrate all that information from the very molecular level to the very integrated level so to know that um, we can really say that this is explaining arrhythmia. I'm not going to go into all these details obviously, um, but I would be um, talking about the ion channels and the myocytes for much of the remainder of my talk later on, but this is, um, this is uh, something I will introduce later. Obviously, your group, your own team, and, and many people who were collaborators over the years have uh, added their uh, piece of, of knowledge and piece of science to this uh, whole uh, topic. Um, and this, these are examples of papers that are really seminal to the field in the way that uh, the complexity of electrophysiological uh, abnormalities as they come with long QT syndrome in particular the function of IKS and, and the long QT syndrome type 1, uh, how they have been integrated to a better understanding, often by combining modeling and experimental work. So I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, much uh, new insights uh, came from uh, the works that were done from either Cleveland or by now from the St. Louis. So uh, that is very important. And I was happy to uh, be the supervisor, one of the people who actually spent a year and a half in your MST here in uh, uh, St. Louis. You may have been a colleague of him, you're the Heimann, who is doing very well by now. He has been married to uh, Claire Copley, um, met here in uh, St. Louis, very productive environment, um, and he is currently working in Essen. So uh, I can tell you uh, hello from him because he explicitly mentions uh, to me to, uh, to say hello to you all. These are people who he worked with. Okay, tiny currents, grave arrhythmias. Um, novel insights into the basic mechanisms of sympathetic induced VT, as well as molecular control of ventricular depolarization to better stimulation and how that implies on the VT syndrome type one. When I was here on uh, March 6 in 2007, I addressed the first uh, portion, so the mechanism of, of arrhythmia, when we just um, finalized a study on a new canine model of drug induced lung QT syndrome, type 1. That paper is published in the meantime, and there is some ongoing work that uh, we were well, very enthusiastic about because it gave us a lot of insight into how things. Uh, work at the intact heart level, so that is intact heart. And today we will be speaking on this other topic that was um, addressed in my lab for the last uh, 10 years, specifically the molecular control, as I mentioned. And uh, here is the current, the current that we are so interesting in, so interested in. Um, this is recordings from a native myocyte, a canine uh, myocyte, where um, in 2003 we described um, well, much of its basic characteristics and the way that it can respond to specific blockers, uh, in this case the blocking uh, of the current uh, with HMR1556, which is a very specific blocker uh, 
which, uh, which is often used even nowadays, even in uh, in vivo uh, experiments. Obviously, there is voltage, de voltage dependency to the activation of the current. Um, it's a time dependent activation as well, uh, and there is a steep um, deactivation in this particular species in the dog, just like it is in humans, um, upon repolarization. Um, often, the current has been projected, especially in the older days, as a current with a major amplitude of repolarizing current, adding to the uh, duration of the action potential duration. I think under basal conditions, that may not be true as much as it has been projected ways uh, back. I think it's fair to say that under basal conditions, this current is of moderate amplitude at the most. Uh, however, it can get to high amplitude upon prolongation of the action potential for other reasons or when beta adrenergic uh, stimulation comes along. And this is what happens. Um, I don't have to explain to you, but it's important for the whole of the story to have a bit of the integrated picture. Um, the red arrows indicate the increase in uh, inward current to the as a response to beta adrenergic stimulation. And the green arrows in particular also, this one, indicate where there is an increase in repolarizing current. And if you would address this, um, let's say, quantitatively, then IKS is the most important current to increase as an outward current upon beta adrenergic stimulation. It's not the only one. But under normal conditions, by far, it's the most important. Um, so that is why, in the case that there is disease or if there is a pharmacological block, you obviously miss that important component. And then you might get the overriding of these inward components to prolong and destabilize the repolarization. Um, here's an example at the cellular level. Um, here we compare a different panels, uh, what happens under normal conditions in a single myocyte, when you uh, just look to the baseline uh, action potential and its variability in duration upon a beat to beat uh, occurrence, then what's happening with isoproteranol and then where the fun starts if you give both this IKS blocker and the isoproteranol. So if you let it run, uh, you obviously recognize on a B2B basis, these are microelectrode recordings of action potentials, the duration, as well as the cell shortening as a poor subrogate of a contraction. Um, and with isoproteranol, you can find that it shortens the action potential clearly, increases the amplitude, and um, it uh, goes along with a very minor stability or instability of the repolarization duration. And Dr. Yamada is in the room, and I know she has been working on this uh, uh, for a long time, and, and also years back, um, because she also was one of the first to show calcium transients uh, with these uh, uh, recordings with isoproteranol. Then what's happening with HMR and isoproteranol? Well, this is happening. What you see is a lot of uh, pro-arrhythmic activity with delayed after depolarizations as well as early after depolarizations as well as trigger beats, those that come with the asterisks, that occur on a spontaneous basis. And along with that, um, there is uh, very much irregularity in the uh, contractile activity with high uh, amplitude uh, contractions if there is no interruption by any uh, events like after depolarizations, but very uh, irregular and low amplitude uh, contractions if there is uh, such after depolarizations based on the fact that it was spontaneous calcium release. Now, if you apply this information to the uh, beating heart, the intact heart, you wonder what is truly the mechanism of arrhythmia in the longevity syndrome. Because we probably uh, know that uh, it's crucially important to have the dispersion of repolarization as one arrhythmia mechanism, but it's likely that also at the level of the diastolic events where triggering can take place, there is major input to the production of arrhythmia uh, under such circumstances. And it's probably underestimated in the in vivo uh, uh, conditions that these diastolic events will also have a major impact there. 
here's what happens in a non QT1 carrier, um, where you might appreciate the fact that the ECG looks pretty normal um, in this 14 year old uh, boy with a QTC of 442 uh, milliseconds um, and very stable and uh, normally bordered uh, uh, T waves. But what happens if you challenge this uh, patient with epinephrine? Well, this may happen. It may be um, quite dramatic in terms of the induction of arrhythmia um, by this provocation. So it's not without danger that uh, this is being done and it should be done always with good monitoring and in a very um, uh, professional and experienced uh, team. Okay. I thought I'd bring also a bit of history to the story because now we gradually move to the single cell and to the channel. Uh, and at the end, you will see a number of uh, new data, relatively new data from our team and other people uh, in the way that we see the function of um, the IKS into the action potential uh, emerge uh, over the years. This is old work from the Rocky Cass uh, group um, uh, at that time when he was still working in Rochester. And what is interesting is that when they treated uh, Purkinje fibers from calf uh, with no uh, epinephrine, they found a dose-dependent um, effect on the duration of the action potential, either shortening uh, of the action potential at high dosage or prolongation at low dosage. And it was absolutely unclear at that time why that was. What was the dose-dependent uh, uh, explanation for this? There's recent work by the group of Don Burs and uh, UC uh, Davis where they argue that it's differences in kinetics of the way of response uh, of for the IKS channel versus the other calcium channel depending on the uh, timing of uh, adrenergic stimulation that may explain why it may be prolonged or it may be shortened. But this is uh, more than, uh, what is it, 32 years later, so uh, really not known at that time. In the same paper, uh, again, this is uh, multicellular preparations, uh, the CAS team uh, at that time found effects of uh, this uh, uh, noradrenaline on the L-type calcium channel, or the calcium current as they uh, recorded it uh, at that moment in time. With a dose dependent effect uh, to increase the amplitude, um, and um, they had interesting uh, subtractions, and you could clearly see this effect uh, as a dose dependent one. Here's the same for the delayed rectifier potassium current, no distinction yet between IKS and IKR, and uh, the way that this also showed those dependency um, with uh, the tail currents being highest um, with the highest dose of treatment. Um, interestingly, both these currents um, showed an effect to protein kinase A. And um, it appeared to be uh, that there was a temperature dependency uh, because of the fact that if you compare A and B, uh, 22 degrees versus 32 degrees, there is a clear difference in the response, not so much for the alpha calcium current, but for sure for the delayed rectifier. So um, we have to be careful if we investigate um, uh, IKS at room temperature to um, account for all of its, um, of its electrophysiological characteristics. And in our case, um, uh, we did this um, both at room temperature and at uh, uh, 37 degrees to account for much of the work. But in recent times, when we work with culture cell, this is often overlooked. There is another effect, and that is the effect of protein kinase C, where uh, clearly it was seen to stimulate IK, but not I calcium. So um, here there was a difference. Protein kinase C appears to be a stimulator uh, of the potassium current only with little effect on the uh, calcium current. So here's 1988. And then just after that, they found, or in that same work, they found its additive protein kinase A and C both enhance IK in a, a summative uh, uh, manner. And just after that, um, it was recognized that IK itself contains of two components or it's actually two currents, because often it's mentioned as components, but it's two different currents, um, by the work of Sanguinetti, who you all very well uh, know. Further on uh, in that paper, um, 
but uh, you know, not in that paper. A little bit later, they recognized the importance of beta adrenergic stimulation to increase IKS, but not IKR. Um, and then we get to uh, the 90s, where the molecular subunits that make the current for IKS um, uh, have been recognized, and a lot of mutations have been found in the meantime. Um, uh, to affect both uh, KCNQ1 and KCNE1, even to the understanding now that uh, it's recognized as a macromolecular signaling complex, as you very well know because you're investigating it uh, here in its own team, uh, where there is oversimplification if we look at it uh, in the way that it was looked uh, on in 2002 um, by the uh, fact that it was really like a two-dimensional structure where obviously we know that it is much more complex than that. Still, this is a landmark paper, I believe, where the CAS team, this is from the CAS team, I think they were already in uh, New York at that time, um, moving from Rochester to New York, um, shows the importance of uh, the C-terminal region where this uh, A-kinase uh, anchoring protein binds to that region and it attracts both PKA and PP1, uh, protein phosphatase 1, to uh, bring the protein kinase A to S27 for its phosphorylation. We will talk about that later. Uh, so that was 2002, very much uh, ahead of its time, very important for the field of the long QT syndrome, but only gradually recognized in the, uh, time there's up the, in the times thereafter. Now, um, uh, and still this is very oversimplified, we recognize the importance of this uh, hetero heteromeric structure with um, four uh, uh, elements uh, binding to become one KCNQ1 uh, subunit uh, with N termini, with C termini, where uh, obviously the crucial uh, contribution of KCN1 to the whole of the current IKS is uh, uh, very important. Um, there is uh, structural connection of the protein uh, and this uh, macromolecular complex to the structural uh, elements like beta tubulins. You can disrupt these tubulins and find that all of your cyclic AMP dependent upregulation is, is, is not available anymore, is not possible anymore. That's, so that's really important to address this uh, in the understanding. There is the importance of calmodulin. We extensively discussed this uh, in the working meetings today. And um, uh, here is this anchoring protein in your tio uh, that is so important for the ultimate phosphorylation at, S, uh, at, N, uh, at the end terminus at S27. So the complexity is emerging uh, on a monthly basis even, and I know you have even nicer models to uh, depict it um, uh, more extensively. Okay. When we read this paper in uh, 2005 and 2007, we were very much interested in the data. This is work from the group of Peter Schwartz, uh, who was inspired and was actually called uh, to come to uh, South Africa because of the finding of Lanky T syndrome in a large founder uh, population. Um, and what appeared is that uh, the genotype uh, showed this mutation, this A341V mutation. And much of the remainder of my talk will deal with, these, uh, with this mutation and the way that we understand its molecular um, uh, regulation and the way that it's defective. A341V showed to have a very um, aggressive and very severe phenotype with uh, a lot of incidence of um, severity um, of arrhythmic uh, problems um, in the uh, early phase of life, even before the age of 20, and, and relative stability in the, in the times thereafter. It was much more severe than the average of the LongQT1 database, which consisted at that time of 355 uh, uh, patients. Now, ob an obvious question was to answer whether this was something specific for the mutation in South Africa or uh, whether it also applied in any A341V mutation outside of the country. And yes, um, comparing these um, two uh, geographical uh, different uh, uh, 
uh, populations, it was found that the um, uh, cumulative event free survival curves almost overlapped. So, this hotspot mutation, because it is one of the most common KCNQ1 mutations, uh, showed the same severity in South Africa in that founder population as compared to others uh, around the world, actually in Japan, in the United States, and even in uh, my country, in the Netherlands. It was also made, it was also compared how the severity uh, um, matched or, or did not match with other mutations in other domains. For instance, mutations in the C and the N terminal domains or in the transmembrane domains. And again, A341V stood out as a very important, most severe mutation. Uh, it was also compared to other dominant negative non A341V mutations and particular also with this one, uh, 314S, where again it stood out. To make a long story short, whatever comparison you make, even if you make a comparison with mutations in the cytoplasmic loop domains, um, or if you make uh, the comparison of A341V with other S6 mutations, I can tell you because we have the data, A341V by far is more uh, severe than the other ones. So, that's an interesting starting point for study at the cellular level. There was some cellular work in this original paper showing that it had the mildly dominant negative effect, um, uh, but not as uh, um, dominant as other mutations. For instance, this 3141, 314S uh, that you see here at the uh, uh, right part. Um, and these are the IP curves that come with these data. And we thought, well, let's do it ourselves. Let's uh, use the information and the experience that we have with this study uh, of this IKS current in native cells, but now in, uh, in cultured cells. And we expressed the mutation in CHO cells. This is the homozygous expression, where wild type is compared to uh, the uh, homozygous expression of the, of the mutant. And you clearly recognize that there is membrane expression uh, for the mutant, so it's not like an obvious uh, um, uh, picture for a trafficking deficient uh, mutation. Here is um, when we expressed it in a heterozygous manner. Um, we labeled the um, uh, loop, um, extracellular loop between uh, the first and the second uh, segment. Um, and we did also for the G, for the C, C terminus of the mutant, and by the overlap and also the uh, uh, plots as they are shown here, it was Agus expression clearly indicated the presence of both the mutants and the wild type um, uh, subunits in the membrane, indicating that any um, uh, electrophysiological data were not, were likely not. Uh, uh, obtained uh, because of the absence of the mutants in the uh, membrane. And then when we uh, looked to the basal currents, well, here you see um, how it came about. It was um, where there is heterozygous expression, it looked like uh, a mildly dominant uh, negative pattern, depending also on um, where you took the amplitudes. So if it was a two seconds depolarization, there was an approximately 57% decree, or what was left of 57% compared to what was shown by Brink et al. So it's fairly comparable here. Um, if you wait long enough, it might uh, reach a higher amplitude um, and have 87% um, uh, of the uh, current compared to wild time. And then we address the question, what's happening if we try to stimulate beta adrenergic sti uh, uh, stimulation? And it, it's very interesting what happened there. Uh, looking to wild type, we found that there is cyclic AMP dependent stimulation even to the level that it could exceed 50% of the increase in current uh, uh, that came with this stimulation. If you look to the homozygous expression of the mutants, there was no stimulation. The 3% really minor, and actually nothing. But then we were surprised to find 
that the heterozygous expression of the value of the mutants did also inhibit the upregulation of IKS. Unlike the findings for other mutations at that time in this field. But these are the um, uh, IV curves uh, that come with these data, as well as the uh, voltage dependence of activation curves, where uh, there is a clear uh, uh, shift in these curves, um, uh, but at a completely different level, obviously, for the mutants versus the wild type versus the heterozygous mutants. Then we thought, let's compare our data to other mutants. So we have A341V uh, data, let's compare them to other mutants as we know them. So we have one uh, mild variant that has a low uh, a clinical phenotype, uh, NDC terminus, K557E. And we have this fin mutation, which was actually the one described in the original science paper by the Casti in 2002. To, um, to find that also for, these, uh, for this uh, variant, just like A341B, heterozygous expression of that mutant led to complete uh, loss of upregulation. As opposed to this other variant, k 57 e where there is such upregulation possible. Um, I should show it here. So it's, it's small to start with, but uh, in, at least uh, it shows significant increase uh, upon cyclic AMP stimulation, as opposed to uh, the fin mutation G589D, which is exactly in the Lucian zipper domain, where your dial binds, where you do not have the um, option and the possibility for your dial mediated uh, protein kinase dependent uh, uh, phosphorylation at S27. So, um, yes, it looked like the variant A341V um, was different for other mutations in the sense that these could show up regulation, but it looked very much similar like uh, G589D, which, by the way, was not uh, shown um, uh, to be expressed also as a heterozygous mutant in that original 2002 paper. So that information um, was also new. And then there was, just after we published these uh, data on A341V, uh, this paper by Barsha Shet et al. Um, in circulation a month later or so, um, where they showed the loss of cyclic AMP dependent upregulation of mutants in the cytoplasmic loop. Um, if you look to these mutants at positions 189, 190, 243, 254, you will find that the colors blue as they come back here. Uh, exactly show the loss of upregulation for those variants as opposed to where it's green, where much of the upregulation is maintained uh, compared to wild type. And here the stimulation was done with force choline. So it looked like this uh, phenomenon was not just uh, limited to A341V or 589D, but clearly also affected other um, uh, locations where mutants uh, were found. Uh, that uh, had this loss of upregulation. So let us go over this scheme. What would happen uh, during the normal beta adrenergic modulation of IKS to address then subsequently what can go wrong in the case of uh, such mutations? In the case of beta adrenergic stimulation, you see a rise in cyclic AMP. You see that. Um, with the help of your thio and with the emerging of protein kinase A, there is um, uh, the binding of these elements to the channel and subsequently the transfer of PKA, of activated PKA, to phosphorylate the N terminal at uh, S27. And subsequently, uh, there's conformational changes that increase the open probability in alpha the kinetics as much as you are investigating it in the modeling work here in, uh, in St. Louis. Um, now, if you further look to the scheme, you will find that then, indeed, a microscopic increase in IKS can be observed. Um, so to address what could be wrong with the mutant present, we uh, propose a number of mechanisms. The, they are indicated in red here. What could be wrong is that A341V disrupts 
you tie your binding to the C-terminus and preventing local PKA-dependent activation. So that would then lead to a situation that it cannot uh, activate channel-bound PKA and the further uh, uh, elements in the circle. So if that is wrong, it's, it's pretty wrong in the beginning of the circle. However, this could be uh, intact, and one could also postulate that A341V disrupts channel phosphorylation even in the presence of butyl. So butyl can bind, uh, but to get to uh, phosphorylation subsequently, um, there might be something wrong in that part of the circle. Even if that is not wrong, you could opt that, okay, a341 disrupts the conformational changes that increase the open probability. So binding is possible, activation is possible, phosphorylation is possible, but then there's no uh, transformation uh, of the uh, current state to have a microscopic increase of the current. And we try to address most of these elements, so most of, the, of these hypotheses. For instance, by having um, this phosphomimetic substitution at S27, uh, S27D, which appeared to rescue the IKS upregulation in the presence of the mutant. In other words, if we bypassed the problem of your dio to activate PKA and then to phosphorylate at S27 uh, by just mimicking the phosphorylation with another mutation, we were able to create this upregulation of this uh, current and to the extent that it very much uh, mimicked what is happening under normal wild type conditions. Um, okay, that's, that's interesting. And the IV curves show the average of, uh, of enough cells to, uh, to confirm that this is applicable for, for it as a mechanism. So it doesn't appear to be um, this part of the curve. It doesn't appear to be uh, the point that um, you cannot get to the conformational uh, change that increases the open, open uh, probability. Then we said, um, let's see if there is an intact interaction with your diet. So case if you want your diet interaction, whether that remains intact. And it looks like it, it's the case. It looks like that if you look at it from the point of view of uh, immunoprecipitation, where there is, although it's vaguely visible, uh, not uh, a difference in the uh, expression of the interaction. Or if you look at it from the point of view that we tested functionally, uh, that indeed this uh, interaction is uh, normal. What is done here is that um, we did this phosphomimetic uh, substitution at S27 but then left out the utayo uh, from uh, the transfection. And as you can see, the diamonds um, indicated here below are clearly different from the situation where utayo is added to the uh, uh, cells and where this uh, phosphomimetic uh, substitution indeed leads to upregulation of the current. So you need utayo for the open uh, probability increase uh, upon phosphorylation of the channel at S27. Uh, again, we focus on another point, and that is, um, is it uh, assumable that uh, there is a reduction in phosphorylation at KCNQ1 S27 by the cyclic AMP? Um, and yes, when we investigated this with a specific antibody that only uh, binds to phosphorylated uh, KCNQ1, phosphorylated at S27, then uh, it gave a difference for wild type versus the mutant, even in the heterozygous situation. Even in the heterozygous situation. So here is homo uh, uh, homozygous, here is heterozygous, um, and if you compare these and you put them uh, as bar graphs, uh, you will find that there are significant differences between the wild type uh, level of phosphorylation compared to how it looks like both for homozygous and heterozygous. Um, and uh, the differences were not different for uh, homozygous and heterozygous uh, expression of the mutant. So that's interesting. So it looks like even 
in the presence of some wild type elements, as this is obviously the case in the heterozygous transfections, uh, these uh, mutant elements are enough to decrease the phosphorylation of S27. And then we said, okay, let's forget about phosphomimetic substitution. Let's inactivate the phosphorylation site. It cannot upregulate, or, or it cannot phosphorylate because we put an alanine at S27, which is a known intervention in the uh, labs of other groups published before, where they did this just to show that S27A uh, more or less mimics the uh, inert state um, where no phosphorylation is possible and in fact it cannot, it cannot occur. And if you look carefully to these data, then you will see that uh, under wild type conditions um, and comparing wild type and S27A heterozygously, heterozygously uh, and they, indeed, there is this loss of upregulation uh, as it uh, would be expected uh, in the presence of cyclic AFP. So looking to these uh, example traces of currents that were recorded, you can see the difference. This is wild type cyclic AMP stimulation where there is phosphorylation possible of S27. Um, if you mimic uh, this, this inert situation where um, uh, A is there instead of S in the heterozygous uh, uh, presence of that uh, substitution, uh, any cyclic AMP dependent stimulation will not lead to upregulation of the current. So if that is the case, if you can create a situation where heterozygous presence of S27A besides the wild type S27 leads to a complete loss of upregulation, even though cyclic AMP is present and wild type elements are, are there to uh, be able, in fact, as you would expect, uh, to go uh, to, to produce phosphorylation, then um, you would also assume, as is the title of this slide, that you need uh, all four elements of KCNQ1 to be there and to be active and to be phosphorylated um, uh, to get full upregulation of the current in the presence of cyclic AMP dependent stimulation. Um, now, obviously, that is the part in terms of uh, um, what uh, is wrong as, we, as far as we got uh, with regard to phosphorylation. But there is another hypothesis of why this A341V mutation could be so. Uh, uh, deleterious, and that is if it had an influence on KCNH2. So apart from the fact and the function of KCNQ1 IKS itself, what would happen if um, um, A341V through alpha-alpha subunit interactions would affect the function of KCNH2? And this is shown for other mutations. So other studies, Joachim Ehrlich is one of the people uh, who did this um, in, in one of his studies, uh, actually more than one study, where he showed that interactions between alpha and alpha uh, siblings influence uh, each other's function and where some mutants in KCNQ1 can address uh, and can affect uh, negatively the presence and the normal function of KCNH2. These data are here to show to you that um, uh, there is no difference in comparing uh, wild type uh, KCNQ1 combined with KCNH2 uh, as compared to uh, the mutant KCNQ1 A341V and H2. In other words, to put this in simple words, um, the mutant KCNQ1 A341V did not affect IKR to produce the QT prolongation as it was found in the patients at least not on the basis of these data. Um, I'm getting to a uh, conclusion of, uh, of this presentation. Um, I'm showing you this slide to indicate that the S6 segment where A341 is uh, sitting is a very interesting segment. It's very interesting because all these mutations as they are depicted here um, show very severe phenotypes in the clinic of patients. 
And if these phenotypes um, should or have to be understood, then probably we have to go through studies as the one that I explained to you in my presentation to get a full picture on what is really happening. Now, I'm very happy with uh, Christina Moreno and the team because she has been working very hard over the last uh, year to provide answers uh, to how, uh, how these other mutations are uh, affected, are affecting uh, the IKS current and the way that it can or cannot be upregulated anymore. And what she did was um, make uh, even more than uh, eight mutations at position 8341V, including uh, G and E, etc. Uh, so, addressing the question of how this mutation or these mutations affect the IKS function, uh, let's say in a horizontal uh, manner, as well as uh, looking to the um, other uh, uh, positions, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and a number of variants that were found there, uh, in comparison to uh, the 3, 4, 1 position. So, her work is ongoing. We have been discussing it extensively in the working meetings uh, with you today. There is a number of questions that need to be addressed, while a um, considerable portion of the work is already done, and I would hope that um, uh, we continue in our discussions to, uh, to help each other in uh, getting some of the answers that currently remain. So, concluding uh, from the slides before, we think that the S6 region at or around 341 is involved in the cyclic AMPD dependent stimulation, no news there. Uh, it, it is under a strong dominant negative control for the IPS stimulation through a cyclic AMP. And we think that these data suggest that you need all four subunits and their phosphorylation to get the upregulation. And then specific mutations indeed disable this uh, dysregulation. Um, if you, if you um, have the presence of the heterozygote A341V, then the loss of the phosphorylation at this uh, site um, yeah, is, is really the explanation for the IKS loss of upregulation. Uh, but it is not through a reduced interaction of KCNQ1 and UTIO or the hindrance of current upregulation after the phosphorylation at S27 as we find. And as a final conclusion, um, other mutations like the fin mutation, as well as the um, uh, substitution uh, of A at S27 at to uh, inhibit phosphorylation, will uh, obviously lead to the loss of cyclic AMP dependent uh, upregulation and indeed indicate uh, that there is dominant negative control uh, in LPT1 for this process. And with that, I thank you for your attendance. Questions to Dr. Walden? Comments to Dr. Walden? So, when you compare the fin mutation, what accounts for the difference in the you know, expression of the phenotype? So severe in the A3 for one. You mean to say that it's less severe in the case of 5A9B and then A3 for one? Excellent question. I don't know. I think um, the answer um, here is, is um, to say that probably it's not a full story. It's not to say that only on the basis of this donor like lots of other regulation, mm -hmm. one can explain everything. Mm -hmm. We have many examples uh, also in our own uh, clinic where um, differences between patients, even in the same family, carrying the same mutation, um, are so uh, large mm -hmm. that other epigenetic or other influences must contribute to the explanation of the difference. It's an excellent question. Um, I, think, it's, it's I think there is some deaths in these patients, by the way. So it's not like it's a mild mutation. The big mutation clearly shows, and this is all the work from the people in Helsinki, um, clearly shows that there is some deaths and events there. But uh, at another severe, it's a uh, three for one. Do you still see that same variability in the uh, patients 
uh, within a family of A341, or are they uniformly really sick? No, they are not uniformly sick. Okay. There are differences. There are okay. some people that go without uh, any uh, area of our mm -hmm. time. Others drop that before the age of 20, um, specifically during sympathetic arousal. Uh, there has been interesting work on the autonomics of these patients, um, where um, um, risk uh, changes in heart rate, probably reflecting risk uh, uh, responsiveness to a uh, sympathetic input to the heart is a dangerous aspect. And um, I think uh, what has been shown already, and this is published, uh, is that these patients may have different uh, additional uh, variants in the uh, central growing markets so that could contribute to the fact that there is such risk in the behavior. Okay, so the uh, C41, uh, the mutation, I mean, apparently uh, the synthetic uh, uh, you know, innovation is very important for, for, for the phenotype. But without a, a synthetic stimulation, the current itself is very small in itself. So in, is there any case in a patient that without a rosal, Without the uh, you know uh, sympathetic uh, stimulation, the patient would actually experience the episode. The episode of severe arrhythmia, you mean, or even that? For the arrhythmia, yeah. Um, I don't think these data are out there. I think it's very hard to tell. I mean, how can we tell uh, that an event as it occurs? Let's say you have a halter, and the halter comes back, and you have. Uh, Looking at the different results of uh, VT, then how can we tell exactly the absence of autonomic or sympathetic input at the moment this VT occurs? You could say, well, this patient is asleep, he's at 2 uh, a.m. in the morning, there's a very slow heart rate, and then the occurrence of uh, VT must stop. This is not what is possible, this is just an example. Um, so then you would expect, no, there is no contribution here of the sympathetic and the personal data. I think this is not the message from, from the one uh, the, uh, the, 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 the message is that the events occur just doing exercise, or swimming, or diving in cold water. These, these are the events. Arousal, emotion, uh, frightening. These are, these are the events. Okay, then for those patients that you know, carry those mutations, do they have a prolonged QT in the bowl, even at rest. Yeah, um, most, of, yeah. most of them do, some don't. Uh, as is normal uh, variability, you find in other uh, populations of non qt one syndrome. Um, and uh, this probably has to do a lot with uh, the poor indication that comes from the disease of the phenotype if you only take into account the PT interval. We were just discussing the beautiful data, I think, here in, uh, in your team um, with regard to ECG imaging patterns of long PT simulators. I don't have to teach you because you've seen the data. They're beautiful in the sense that you might find important gradients of digitalization even in the presence of a uh, pretty normal uh, so I think uh, this is exactly the way to go. And I give you another point here. Uh, apart from the fact that you may find these gradients upon non-invasive ECG imaging, uh, our experience, and Rachel Rebecca has, uh, has worked on this, is also that um, there is probably mechanical influences in the human body that feedback on the uh, tendency of the uh, Depolarization to destabilize the rhythm. So it's not only the direct and only the active electrical events that make interference to occur in the face of uh, instability. It's probably also feedback from the uh, mechanics of the heart in the way that there is a kind of electrical feedback that may be of influence. The other comment is that there is always data in the yeah, right. That's my question. Uh, as well. If in this patient, the distribution of 
snare being put, snare bandings into the heart is often what is part of the abnormality because, because after all there's a weakness occurring in, in the whole heart, not in a single cell or single channel level. So then you start to have to take into account all of the spatial heterogeneities that could be totally different from the effect on the single cell due to the mutation. Once you take those into account, the story becomes much more complex. Right? So Before I answer your question. But we see, we see in all of the long KT1 patients that we've done, we see two things. We see general prolongation, the Tramia's work. We see general prolongation of the action potential duration everywhere. And we see regions where it's prolonged more than neighboring regions to create large gradients. So LQT1, and they were done under uh, rest conditions, so they don't know if the patient is there with the CCG vest on, you don't know how excited they are, and how much beta the narrative tone they have. But it's not only just the tone, so my understanding, I had the same well, problem. By the way, we never had an arrhythmia. We never got an arrhythmia. You never got you, I see. The arrhythmia could be due to a bolus. Alright, so this is yeah, so for this is what I we never caught an arrhythmia. We caught prolonged arrhythmias and gradients, but never an arrhythmia. So maybe the trigger and the arrhythmia which is known to occur in the bolus of prolonged energy requires that. So, so really here the anatomy is crucial. The anatomy is such that the input to the heart by sympathetic fibers is, is, is very different between individuals and is also very different for the input that comes from the left part of the sympathetic system compared to the right part, even apart from the fact that there is ganglia on the roof of the atrium and, and the back side of the heart. So, um, and we haven't mentioned this in any of the meetings, but, but Rachel is conducting studies in dogs where we uh, apply um, sympathetic in, uh, input to the heart, sympathetic stimulation to the heart under conditions that we mimic the long KT1 syndrome uh, with, with a drug. This is, this is in line with the model that I showed you that we published on. And this, uh, this gives fantastic data, very refractory VF uh, upon stimulation of the heart under such conditions. Now, the people from Amsterdam who were here just before we came uh, have uh, very interesting and, and actually uh, data from a long time ago where in dogs they were able to um, delineate the uh, consequences of sympathetic inputs to the heart in terms of uh, uh, the way that it affected repolarization. And in normal hearts, um, left sympathetic input to, to, uh, to stimulate it, um, the uh, uh, parts of the heart that were uh, affected most were from the posterior and, and, um, and lateral side, even a little bit of the septum, as opposed to input from the right sympathetic system, which affected most of the atria and the sinus node, as well as the uh, right ventricle and the septum uh, that remained. But this was very different between animals, very different. So any picture of sympathetic stimulation to the heart, specifically under circumstances of long KT1 syndrome, where it looks like there is a homogeneous input, and it all comes from the level of responsiveness in terms of phosphorylation and upregulation, is a very incomplete picture because it's very different between people, individual differences, as well as um, affected by disease. We cannot expect that diseases like infarction or sarcoidosis have major input, a major effect uh, um, on the uh, anatomical distribution of the fibers. Um, and as such, um, you may find examples, and we have them in our, in our, um, in our own clinic, of people that have a normal genotype but an abnormal QT um, uh, on their ECG, where the MIBG scan, I mean, the best we can do currently in, in, in getting the clinical images of patients are, is completely abnormal, completely abnormal, even empty. So these examples exist and um, uh, they have a major separate addition to the complexity of arrhythmogenesis in OKT1 syndrome. 
selectomy, you know, is, is one way of uh, <coughs> So, um, have you tested or do you know of data to see if in wild type KCNQ1, the phosphorylation of S27D, does it depend on the conformational state of the protein, the actual phosphorylation? You mean the phosphorylation of S27, not by the, the natural stimulation, right? right. And whether that has an influence on the conformation? Whether the conformation has an influence on the level of phosphorylation. For example, right. if you stimulate in a depolarizing solution, bathing solution, versus a hyperpolarizing, will yes. you see a difference in the level of uh, phosphorylated S27 by your antibody? Okay, I think Christina can answer that question because she did some experiments in that direction. Yeah, well, we studied it. Um Phosphorylation was more dependent uh, because, uh, yeah, we could not. One hypothesis that could explain why this residue is not uh, phosphorylation as it should be is because uh, the channel cannot reach. Well, the gating, the electrophysiological properties of it for one are really different. Uh, there is a huge shift uh, to what really the polarized potential. So maybe we thought that the channel needs to be in a specific conformation before it can be phosphorylated. And uh, so, if it's focused the and uh, yeah, we um, applied cyclic AMP without passing the cell, and uh, we waited uh, for uh, five ten minutes without passing the cell, and then if uh, it's uh, if there is a voltage dependent, we would expect to see their response when we start passing the cell. So we get the cell in a closed state, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, when we apply, when we start passing the cell, the effect of static IMP appeared. So it was not like a zero, 100 percent, but we observed that uh, there is kind of, or we think there is a voltage uh, dependence. So, so in what system did you do this study? In Chill cells. Chill cells. The same with, system. With the yeah. uh, with the expression of uh, of the UDL and uh, yeah. and the I uh, casing one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the same conditions uh, in heteropsychosis also. So one, one, one tip in that direction, or one solution, is the fact that you need E1 in order to see the effect of phosphorylation. I want to post maybe to phosphor. So that has an effect on the information which is major. And the presence of these mutations at near the gating hinge and also near the, you know, at an S45 looker. Yeah, but just docking E1. Yeah, so, so uh, is it known that uh, when you don't have E1, uh, you don't see the, uh, you know, the, uh, the second MP effect? Right. But you don't know if it's phosphorylated. Is it, is it a phosphorylated? Or yes, it's phosphorylated. It's a still phosphorylated? Yes. I think uh, uh, it's a paper by Sorry, I, 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 I So it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the phosphorylation. No. So the structural, it's such as the result in the morning, it probably changes the your confirmation library in, 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 a, in a direction that it has more of an open probability. It's the effect of the phosphorylation that it's not <coughs> sure. But then, then it'd be interesting. With, I, with KCN1, the phosphorylation level, as you just said, depends on voltage. So that it depends on the conformation of the channel in the open, being open and closed. But now, if you don't have case in E1, if you just have a case in Q1, you see the phosphorylation. Do you see that the phosphorylation level depends on voltage? It's interesting. We'll experiments. We have case in E1 with well, you would, According to Kurokawa, you would be able to detect it, right, with the electrophysiology. But with the uh, uh, antibody, you could. Yes. You know, it makes sense that if, you, if phosphorylation has effect on, on channel opening, then you know reverse yeah. you know the reverse reversely the uh, conformation can also affect the phosphorylation. Perfect. So without the case in U1, when phosphorylation doesn't affect the uh, channel opening, yeah. then we probably shouldn't see the the, the opening or or change the phosphorylation. The other the other interesting thing is is whether you know you had those other mutations that can rescue. And you don't see any effect in KCMT1 without E1 being there. 
The question is whether the rescuing mutations can start showing an upregulation even without E1. And that's sort of an interesting experiment to do. Yes, and I think we did it. And I forgot the result. <laughs> <laughs> All right, these people have jet legs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much.